All right, we're going to get started. My name is Jim Moran. I'm the president of the County Commissioners. Uh, this evening, we have Commissioner Chris Corcorino, Commissioner Jack Wilson, and Commissioner Patrick McLaughlin. Uh, Commissioner Dumanall could not make it this evening, so he, he's, he apologizes for that. Uh, I see our delegates, Delegate Arntz is here. Uh, I see the Director of State Highway, Will Pines, standing right here, uh, and the Sheriff's in the back, so we'll keep it cordial. Um, so what we're going to start with, and, and I want to thank everybody for, one, sitting here for the last 45 minutes until we got everybody in the building, uh, but, but two, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come to us and tell us your thoughts and your impressions of, of what we're trying to do. So what I'm going to do is, is I want uh, Commissioner Corcorino is going to come up, and last night at our, our uh, commissioner's meeting, we had a gentleman come in with a very interesting story, and I think it, it relates to what we're trying to do here. So, Chris? Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Commissioner Chris Corcorino. I, I live on Route 8, so this rent management program is something that does affect me and my family as well. And we're going to go through the process of how we got here, the different ideas that we've gone through, things that work and don't work, and we've uh, put some videos out to explain some of them, but we'll be going over them again today. Uh, but I think one of the fundamental things that we need to understand is one of the most important reasons why this is something we need to be attempting. And that was sort of driven home to all of us. Last night at our commissioner meeting, there was a gentleman who lives in Cloverfields, and he told us a story about he was outside his house going for a run, um, and he had what is known as a widowmaker heart attack uh, and collapsed right outside. And this is a, a young guy. He's in his 30s. And fortunately, the emergency services was able to get there and put the defibrillator on him, get his heart going again. And they brought him to Anne Arundel, and he underwent surgery. And he was in a medically induced coma for 48 hours. And his wife was told, don't expect much. There could be brain damage because of the heart attack. And when he regained his consciousness, fortunately, there was no brain damage. And he's made a full recovery. And his wife is not a widow. If that had happened on a Sunday in the summertime, we could have had a very different outcome. Right? And so the commissioners, every Monday we get reports from the Department of Emergency Services and tells us about what are the calls, the call volume that we've been having, what are the critical ones, the minor calls. We also get numbers about how many times are all of our ambulances out of the county at one time? And that does happen sometimes. Or how many times is it that the ambulances that are stationed on Kent Island are at Anne Arundel and because of the wait time, they're sitting there for an hour and a half or two hours? And then the volunteer fire department, they got their ambulance in there at Easton, and they're sitting and waiting. And we have to move equipment around the county to make sure that we can keep that first responder time that we, we value so much. We don't have a hospital in this county, but if you have a heart attack and we get to you, and we get your heartbeat going again, we can get you to the best medical care in the world right here in Maryland. And we have added ambulances over the years. We've made sure that the Sheriff's Department all has the uh, defibrillators on all of their equipment so that we can respond quickly in emergencies. But that's dependent on getting the emergency services to people. So we get calls for a two-year-old who fell into a pool and he's non-responsive. And we have to have the ambulance get there and do CPR. Or someone who's had a stroke or a fire that started in someone's home and the kid's home alone. These are real things that we get updates about. And we take an oath of office. One of the most important things that we have is the health and safety as residents. And we take that very seriously. And I'm not trying to discount any of the inconvenience that people have from the ramp management program, but I'm just trying to underscore the things that we have, the weight of the things that we have to do, and we have to do a balancing act on everything. Um, and it's not that your concerns and your life aren't important, but it could be your kid or your grandkid or your loved one that's having a heart attack or fell into a pool or a fire. And if we can't get to you, we can't do anything. And we have times when, because 50 gets backed up and people go off onto 18, those backups go clear past several of our fire departments. And these are volunteer fire departments. They're not there all the time. So the volunteers have to get from their house to the fire departments to even get to the equipment to respond to accidents and fires. And they can't do that if Route 18 is blocked or their, their, their time is impacted by that. That is a very serious concern that we have. 
And that is one of the reasons, one of the driving reasons really, why we're trying to see what can we do to mitigate the impact of summer traffic. And there are long-term and short-term goals, right? Long-term goals will require major infrastructure to really just keep that traffic flowing through so that everybody can live their lives on Kent Island and not be impacted. And people in Graysonville and Queenstown can get around to visit grandkids, to go to the supermarket, so you can go out to the restaurant on the weekend and not be a prisoner in your own home. Short-term, what do we have, right? We, we have tried a lot of different things, and as Jim will explain, this is a program that has been in the works for a very long time, even to sort of to uh, us to be able to get the partnership that we have with the state. And, and, and I got to thank the state for being here, in particular Will Pines with State Highway. He was with MDTA before that. He's been a great partner to help Queen Anne's County come up with some ideas. And is it the best idea? No, there's no perfect idea, right? And, and the pilot program, it was messy. It's going to continue to be messy. And as you'll hear, we learned some things from the initial pilot program that we're implementing now to try to reduce the impact. And as it goes forward, we'll continue to learn and try to implement new things. Um, if we can find a way to get people from Route 8 to be able to get straight on the bridge without having to do that, we'd love to do that. Um, it's not in the current plan, and you'll, you'll hear why some of those things don't work. But I wanted to sort of underscore, because that story that we heard last night, that's, that's why we do what we do, trying to help people and make sure that those services are there. That's why we have the sheriff here, we've got emergency services here, they can tell you about how the traffic can impact them in, in doing their job. And, and we have, I think, the best emergency services and the best law enforcement um, in Maryland, award-winning lowest crime in Maryland. We have great response time. We have a lot of things to be proud of, and we want them to be able to do their job. So I thank you. And again, I don't want to underscore um, or undermine anybody's impact of what, what the rent management program might do to you. But I, I do want you to understand, because we see social media posts, we hear emails, and people think, what are the commissioners thinking? They don't care about us. They don't listen to us. We do care. And, and that's why we're doing this. And we wish we had the magic wand to do the perfect solution that doesn't impact anybody. But we, we don't have that, and we'll explain a little more today about what we're doing to try to get through that and, and why some alternatives you might have heard won't work. So thank you. I'm going to pass it to Commissioner Moran, but we'll all be here to talk some more and answer some more questions. So what we're going to do is, is, is I'm going to give you a brief summarization of how we got here. Uh, this presentation shows you what we're trying to do, and then we're going to open it up to the public for comments and questions. So. About, uh, well, ever since I've been a commissioner, my biggest issue has been the bridge and the bottleneck and the backups in our communities and the quality of life. So in 2018, we came up with a plan to close ramps down, uh, take control of Route 18, but sorry to say that's illegal. We can't do that. Uh, that's uh, federal funding going into building these roads, so you can't close them off to specific groups of people. So the way you get around a specific groups of people, you close it to everyone. So that's one of the things that, you know, that we're dealing with. Uh, the Bay Bridge itself, uh, as you all know, uh, phase one of the NEPA selected this corridor that's here now. The state owns all the land, the, st the state owns the right of way, and, and the, 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 the reason for the choices was what, what one of the corridors, which one of the corridors would relieve the most amount of pressure and traffic right here in, in Queen Anne's County, in a new bridge here of eight lanes or 10 lanes, and, and that's what they're working on. So we're in phase two. Phase one says it's going to go here. Phase two is going to tell you exactly where it's going to go. Is it going to be a bridge? Is it going to be a tunnel? Is it going to be a bridge tunnel? All these factors are playing in, and uh, phase two of the NEPA uh, takes about four years. And all the way in the back, Melissa, M Melissa, wave your hand, Melissa. Melissa is with the study, the study group. So she's got information back there. You have questions. You know, she's taking in, input also about this bridge. And we're, we're not even, we're, we're close to being halfway through phase two. And then after phase two is engineering and after that's construction. So honestly, looking for a bridge in the next five years isn't gonna happen. Next 10 years, possible. But until then, we have to do something to get the citizens of Queen Anne's County to move around. And also what, you know, uh, Chris, Mr. Corcorino, Commissioner Corcorino said, uh, it's our number one priority, the safety of the citizens of Queen Anne's County, and we, we don't take that lightly. So, you know, the, the, the safety first and getting to our, you know, and I, I hate to bounce around, but in the last 10 years, our population has only grown by 2,000 people, but we've added two full 24-7 EMS units, and, and, and that's 
Part of the reason is because of the congestion that goes on. So, you know, that's where we sit right now. Uh, th there's nothing that we can do that we aren't already doing to speed the process up to get us relief. So I, I know that uh, I know a lot of you don't have this presentation, so we're going to go through this. It's the 5301 ramp management. In 2023, Queen Anne's County and the Maryland State Highway Administration conducted a pilot ramp management project along westbound US 5301 from Castle Marina Road to Maryland 8. SHA collected the traffic data to determine if managing the flow of entering traffic would ease local congestion on Maryland 18 and improve traffic flow westbound 5301 during peak weekend travels. Next slide. So as I said, we, you know, this, this all started in 2018. We had a beach to bridge plan. We met with the state and numerous other uh, agencies uh, and we just could not get that to work. We can't take control of those ramps. We don't own those ramps and you cannot, again, you cannot say, you, since you don't live here, you can't go on it. It's just the, the law's different. So why are we closing the, the Route 8 ramp? Again, with that, we can't restrict it to just out-of-towners, beach traffic. It has to be closed for everybody. And what that does when you close that ramp, uh, and so let me, let me tell you, the choke point, and anybody that travels the bridge saw on the western shore, the choke point was right there at the Bay Bridge. People would get on the side street, come in, and what that does is that slows the traffic down, slows it down to a crawl. These, when these bridges were built, those lanes, each lane was rated at 1,500 vehicles an hour. We've never, and we have three lanes, that's 4,500, we've never come close to 4,000, just because that traffic slows down. So what you do is the choke point, by closing Route 8, by closing Duke Street, and by closing the shopping center exit, it allows that traffic, instead of slowing down to let people merge, speed up. So instead of going over the bridge at 10 miles an hour or 12 miles an hour, we're doing 35, and we're getting more vehicles through. And with that, um, you know, that, that alleviates a lot of the traffic. Uh, how many people here are from uh, Queenstown or, or Graysonville or Chester? Yeah, so we got a good bit. We got a good bit. And I th I'm sure they can tell you how long it takes to get to Safeway on, on a Saturday. And, and it's, it's a problem. And it's a problem countywide. So with that, the change in behavior, uh, it's not going to happen over one weekend. It's not going to happen on one weekend where we're going to change these, these traffic patterns and everyone's going to go, okay, this is the new way and, and we're going we're to be able to speed up and not be confused. It's going to take months and, and the, the, to condition and not to condition our citizens because we're, we're here now and we, we know what we have to do, but the beach traffic. Navigation software, Waze, Google, they're our enemy. So the, the only way that we can get them to say, to tell people, that, for instance, the backup, about 80% of our backups go all the way to Castle Marina. Then you get about another 15% that get you to, to the Kent Narrows, and then we have those July 4th, the big ones, the backup 16 miles an hour, those kind of things. But with that, Waze will tell you, jump onto 18. By closing the, these exit ramps, they are notified that they're closed. They don't give that option. The traffic stays out on Route 50. And that's why, we, that's why we're back here again today doing this because we want to see. Last year, it was, you're right, it was late after the season. We had an accident on the bridge. Traffic was moving perfectly until we had an accident on the bridge. And that's going to happen. We don't control that, but we hope it doesn't happen that much. So that's one of the reasons for closing them. Because so now Waze and, and Google and the rest of them know that it's closed. They keep people on to Route 50. Uh, the no left turn, it, it, it uh, remains open. Navigation soft, if it's open, navigation software will see that and they'll throw people out onto Route 18. And that's what we're trying to avert. We're trying to keep 18 open for our two emergency services and our, and our two uh, fire, main firehouses and for our, our citizens. I know that we've gotten a lot of emails where it took 25, 30, 45 minutes the day of the accident to, tra you know, to, tra to traverse that little loop around. But I can tell you, every weekend, I can't tell you how many people in Graysonville or Queenstown say it took me an hour to go to Safeway. I gave up. I mean, uh, you know, it's, and that's another thing. We, you know, our job is not only is safety, but it's that we govern for everybody, not just Southern Kent Island, everybody. Next slide. So the time, this is going to start um, April, excuse me, May 19th. 
May 19th. Uh, Kent Island Day is on the 18th. Uh, it was supposed to start then. We said, no, we're not going to have that many people coming to visit in too much confusion. So it starts on the 19th. Jack Broderick's in the back there. He's more than happy with that. Um, the dates, again, to start on the 19th, May 19th, through Labor Day weekend, Saturdays and Sundays. Holidays, we, we will Memorial Day and Labor Day. There, it will also be shut for Monday, so Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Uh, so one of, the, one of the important things on the time here, where, where I talked about earlier how we're, we're trying to gather the data and see how we can change things as we go along, what do we learn? So the start time of 12, that's a later start time than the initial pilot program. Right? And, and one of the reasons we're hoping that this is going to help some people who reached out that they have work shifts, they got to get across the bridge on a Saturday. They said, you know, if it started a little bit later, that's going to help them to be able to get to those shifts. And then we figure checkout time, Ocean City, 10 o'clock by the time they get here, it's 12 o'clock and the traffic really is sort of building after that. And looking at the data flow that the state provided us of how many people actually are using that exit on a Saturday when we weren't doing ramp management. Um, and this was going to provide some relief for those people. So we modified it to have a later start time. And can, can we do an even later start time? M maybe we're gonna learn that. Can we end it earlier? Th these, this is the, we're talking about where we're learning as we're going and we're implementing change. We're trying to make this a fluid process. That's one of the things that we learned from the initial pilot study that we can do a later start time and that's gonna hopefully alleviate the burden on some people. I, again, I know it doesn't for everybody, but we're trying to, as we go along, where can we keep tweaking the system? I just wanna make sure we point that out. Absolutely. You know, and that, 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 that is a very good point um, because as anybody that travels that intersection knows on Saturdays, right around 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, that's when things get really bad in both directions. Sunday it's westbound. Sunday it's westbound and, and, and eastbound isn't is such a, an issue. But, uh, and also our friends at uh, MDTA uh, controlling the bridge, priority goes to the side that has the most traffic. And what that means is if those three lanes uh, can get down to two lanes, but it still has more traffic than the, the two lanes, they're going to get the third lane. So it's not going to be a given that we get that third lane and travel going westbound all the time. It's, that's just not going to be the case. Uh, it'll depend on what the, the, the amount of backup is. And that's something, again, all this we're learning now, and, and we need to put it to play after a good two, three months to see where this goes. Next slide. Yeah. So we talked about the, uh, the timing what time they're going to be open, closed, uh, the dates, and the continue to study. So I will tell you that each and every one of us last year made that loop no less than six or seven times driving it. And I was in it when the accident happened. And I saw the backup, and I under totally understand that. And it's unfortunate. And, and, and we're, we're happy that, not happy, but we're, we are, we have to do something so we're, we're glad that we're here and we're going to do this again and see if it does make a difference. And, you know, I, I'm, I apologize to Southern Kent Island. It's not something that we're trying to do to make your life miserable at all. We're trying to improve the quality of everybody's life. And if it costs you another 10 minutes, you know, we're sorry, but I think that's, it's, it's fair. You know, and a, a good point that Commissioner Wilson just brought up. I don't know how many people know that the 301 bypass has grown exponentially every year since it's opened. I mean, anybody that traveled up 301 towards Delaware would see a car every couple minutes. It's, it's heavy. And we're counting all that traffic. We have counters at the bridge. We have counters at the 5301 split. We have counters at 404. We're, we're monitoring where the traffic's going and where it's coming from. All this plays into this. And now with, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the tragedy at the Key Bridge, we're not seeing too much of that, with the exception of we are seeing an uptick in tractor-trailer traffic. So, and now, you know, this is one of the corridors is a prior priority for hazardous material. So we have that, you know, going for us also. But uh, everybody's rowing in, in the same direction. I can't say that enough about our, our state uh, agencies. I mean, everybody's working for the same thing and they're going as quickly as they can with this NEPA to get moving forward. So we'll go from there.